<laughs> yeah. Oh, that's like a real keg. Maybe, Maybe a kegerator. Uh, I'm going to say pony keg, so sorry. All right. <laughs> oh, nice. Cold. All right. What do you reckon? All righty then. I think we'll kick things off if that's okay with all of you. Uh, hi, I'm Peter, and I am CEO of Sinterra, and I have two amazing people here with me. Robert, who is the CEO of Sincere, um, a fintech that's launching on our platform very shortly, and then uh, Eric is the CEO of Coastal. And what we're going to do today is talk to you a little bit about partnership banking and all the different things that you need to consider and how you get banked, how you build, and all of that side of things. So three-way conversation with different perspectives from each of us. A little bit about me. Um, I started Sinkterra. We started Sinkterra about a year ago. It's uh, been kind of crazy. Uh, we're already up to 100 people in the team, and we're building effectively a two-sided marketplace. Fintechs on one side, banks on the other, and they partner together to build the next great, cool innovation and so forth. Uh, earlier, I did a couple of years running payments and risk and everything at Uber for uh, all of our customers across the globe. And for a while, I did a, a stint at Google running Google Wallet, and before that, Yodli and a bit of Nokia stuff and that sort of thing. So a bunch of different fintechs, uh, built one of the first core banking systems on Windows back in the 90s. Uh, so I guess this isn't my first dance. Uh, so anyway, so a lot of different things going on on our side. Uh, my colleagues here, Robert, do you want to say hi? Yes, hi. Um, I'm Robert. Um, so I'm the founder of, uh, one of the co-founder of Sincere. So um, my background is uh, just being different startups. Um, most famously, we were acquired by Walmart, our last startup. And we founded Walmart Labs, and we did an innovation for them. Um, and then this year, early this year, I spun out and created Sincere, which is um, essentially a financial ecosystem for the pet for pet parents um, and our first product is a cashback debit card for spending on your pets um. awesome and Eric well thank you guys for attending humbled uh, to be included so coastal community bank is 26 years old two plus billion um, probably more appropriate for this group as we have a division called CC BX, which is our partner banking division. Uh, I have some friends out in the, the audience. Two, my, all two friends I have are here. Um, <laughs> but we have 28 partners on the platform now, and the most recent one that just went live was Bluevine on Tuesday. So fun and exciting. We've been doing it about six years, and I think that'll do for now. Awesome. So I guess the first thing to sort of level set is what is partnership banking? Because there's a lot of different sorts of terms being thrown around here and everywhere. Uh, the first, most important thing is it's not open banking. So if you heard Angela talking earlier, open banking is a bank exposing themselves to everybody else to have access to their data. So in the old days, uh, when we were at Yodley, we did a combination of direct data feeds and connections to the banks, and then we screen scraped a, a lot of the, the long tail. And that allowed everybody else in the fintech economy to build apps doing account verification and so forth. This is not that. Open banking is awesome. It started in, in Europe, where they mandated it by law, which is great, except if you're a bank. Um, and, they, and every bank was basically staring at a, you're going to get penalties and problems. And then the EU blinked, and there was like another year's delay and so forth. But PSD2 is a was the sort of the genesis of open banking as a spec. And then it evolved from just data access to also payment initiation, which is kind of cool. So if you're a fintech in Europe and you're certified uh, as a PISP, you can actually connect directly to a bank and initiate a transaction at the bank on behalf of their customers. And it just kind of sort of works, mostly-ish. Um, there isn't very much standardization on how the open banking has been implemented, but it works kind of cool. So we're not that. We're definitely not embedded finance, but we could be. Think of embedded finance as uh, all the use cases where you're an existing business doing something else, and you want to add payments, or you want to add banking, or you want to add 
faster access to payroll and things like that. We can help people do that, but that's not what partnership banking is either. Uh, it's not just banking as a service, and this is really important. So in the early stages of uh, post-Durban, uh, call it 2011, 2012, when the law came into effect, banking as a service emerged with four big banks, or four original banks, Bancorp and Metabank and Green Dot, and the fourth one, I forgot, Netsped and Cross River. And basically what they did was they said, hey, fintechs, go build your thing, we'll lend you our license, and we'll rev share on the interchange. And if you're a community bank, uh, that was a great deal, because you weren't getting, your normal organic growth wasn't so big, and you're starting to get non-transactional, non, uh, in net interest margin spread revenue, you're getting transaction fees, you're getting volume, and so on. But banking as a service from the bank's perspective in terms of revenue is primarily a ref share on interchange. So if you could do all small business programs, you'd be better off because those earn 240 bips. Uh, but macro, if you're thinking about who's on the hook, ultimately the bank has the, the job of making sure the fintechs don't screw up. And if they don't get it right, bad things happen. And historically, pretty much the majority of the early uh, community banks that were in fintech banking have all had challenges with the regulators. And those challenges, uh, we lived personally at, at Yodley where we got a call from our bank after we just launched funds transfer for Scott Trade. And they said, well, got good news, the service is going great, bad news, can you get off my bank, you have two weeks to comply. <laughs> and that was relatively unpleasant, so we found another bank um, and literally migrated all the users and all the ACH endpoints, it was a mess. So, What's happened is, over time is the banks uh, have been quite successful in franchising themselves to work with fintechs, but many of them have failed to keep up with their own obligations for compliance or regulatory support and things like that. And the challenge with that is, at some point in time, most likely annually, some set of regulators is going to come in and say, hey, Eric, how's your programs going? Any problems to report? All that sort of thing. And if you're not buttoned up and you don't know what you're doing, that can turn into something pretty unpleasant. If, for example, you had forgotten to do KYC of users, or if you weren't watching transactions for AML. Uh, this may or may not have happened at some banks. The challenge on the banking as a service side of things is, if you're a fintech, the only thing you're getting from the bank is access to the banking ecosystem, and you still need to go do all the partnerships with everybody else, from someone to do KYC, someone to do Ledger, and so forth. So partner partnership banking is the evolution of that, where we're actually expanding the definition of banking as a service to fintech as a service, whereupon, as a bank, they're offering to the fintechs the full stack of capabilities, whether it's printing a card, managing risk, dealing with fraud, operating a ledger, all those sort of capabilities. And that's the minimum stack that we're building and that then we offer through banks like Coastal as, as we go to market. The other sort of way to think about it is it's all about working together to build the solutions for the consumers. And this is the really critical thing. It actually makes a difference that Robert and Eric know each other because when something goes wrong, and inevitably something will go wrong, inevitably there'll be some crazy fraud or something like that, the relationship has to be aligned for success. And so if you're a bank, you wanna have your own contracts or wanna have your own relationship with your FinTech. And if you're a FinTech, you wanna have access to as many banks as possible to find the best deal but once you've got that deal in place, it's a pretty good sort of strong commitment that you're making to each other, and that's what we try and support. Ideally, if you're a bank uh, and you haven't done this sort of technology before, which is almost all of the community banks, you'll find a provider like us or Treasury Prime or Unit or someone else to provide the tech stack that the fintechs use and the operating system, if you will, so you can keep track and monitor what's happening at each of the fintechs. So that's what we mean by partnership banking. What we're doing and what we think is the most valuable is to build a marketplace where banks and fintechs can meet in the middle, match on price, and then go to market. So with that said, we're gonna sort of split this up into three steps. First, we're gonna have Eric talk a little bit about what it means to be a bank and working with fintechs and all the compliance obligations. And one of the things that is pretty clear is, relatively uniquely in the last two or three years, you started to see community banks recreated, so de novo banks, which has been very rare, hasn't happened for a long time. And so many of the banks we're talking to these days literally have no consumers or, or small business customers. Their only purpose in being is to support fintechs. 
And so that burden of learning how to be a bank is actually something legit. And um, Eric has, I'm sure, been through a bunch of fun with various fintechs learning how to be a fintech bank, but I'll pass it over to you, Eric, to have a quick chat. Well, thanks, Peter, and, and really open dialogue today. I don't know where everybody is on their individual journeys, so stop me at any time and ask questions, too. Um, otherwise, listen, I'll talk. We have an hour and a half of my presentation, four hours for you two. And this is post-lunch. We need to spice it up a little. So let me just start by telling you our journey. And then we'll digress. We'll talk a little bit about this because it's weird. Listen, I'm a community banker. I was at Big Bank. So, and, and randomly, one of my directors, Mr. Hovde, are you in the, the office? Is he back there? I don't know. But one of my directors is actually here. And he and I, about six years ago, went to lunch with a small bank CEO in Seattle because our bank's just north of Seattle. And it was for sale. It was troubled. And we met with the CEO, and the CEO is like, dude, you don't want our bank. You've got a good bank. It's clean. We're problem. I've already got this thing sold. Don't do it. And this guy that ran an $80 million little chartered bank in Seattle was the vice chair, former vice chairman of B of A World. And I was like, Randy, why, why are you even here? Right? I mean, you, what are you doing with this little charter? He's like, well, I don't care about the bank. I was doing it so I could launch our fintech platform. I'm like, ooh, do tell. So he had partnered with a gentleman named Arkady Kuhlman. If you remember him from the ING Direct days, the park, the park bench, the line on the park bench, the ING Direct US, ING Direct Canada, Arkady grew that from 100 billion, zero to 100 billion in 10 years. Grew Canada zero to 10 billion in 10 years. Eventually sold the US to Capital One and Canada to Nova Scotia Bank, I think. But anyway, so Arcadi had partnered with a technology company out of China. Now keep in mind, back in 2015, the Chinese were still cool, so don't think I'm weird. But this little company called Tencent, and they really wanted access to the North America payment systems. And Arcadi, being a branding visionary, teamed up with a gentleman named Frank Sanchez of now Finzac, but Frank Sanchez of Sanchez & Associates was FIS, the, the founders of that, if you remember profile and platform. So anyways, you've got these powerhouse. You have Tencent with, I don't know, a billion plus customers. You've got Arcadi, marketing genius extraordinaire, and you've got Frank, who's a brilliant, right, uh, builder of technologies, and, but they still needed a stupid little bank charter. That little piece of paper was the only thing stopping them from world domination. And literally, it was Tencent they think world domination. So uh, me, I'm like, okay, what do we need to do at Coastal? So fascinating topic. Partner banking was around, but nascent at the time. Heavy prepaid cards at the time, if you remember. Uh, APIs were cool, but being developed and what have you. And so, but we start going down this path. This leads you to the complications of, it took us 18 months of attorneys, consultants, regulatory meetings to get to the point to where the FRB San Francisco finally said to Coastal, we like it, you can proceed to negotiate with them. <laughs> and we're like, cool, okay, let's start talking. So we, we get down the path all the way to the 11th hour with Zen Bank was the name of it. Those of you from Palo Alto might remember them, but that was the FinTech name. So we get all the way to the 11th hour, and on December 23rd, I can still remember this, Arcadi calls me, and I'm like, Arcadi, dude, what's up? And he's like, hey, Eric, how's everything going? I'm like, good. I'm like, are you okay? Why are you calling me? Right? We just shook hands literally like five days later. Why are you calling me over Christmas break? He's like, well, I've got bad news. Dude, no, 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 no. What, what could it possibly be? Arcadi says, I'm sorry, but we sold the SoFi. They offered us X amount more, I can't disclose it, and they're going to close on January 1st, and sorry, it's been nice knowing you for two years, Eric, but we got to break up. Now, what you guys have got to realize is I touched fintech. I bought a new car, I bought a second house, listen, <laughs> the family was going to Fiji on Monday, I, I was loaded, I was going to be a fly on the wall collecting ticks, right, as things went along. I had the bug, I was a billionaire up here. Okay. So Arcadi breaks my life. I have to tell the wife we're still poor. We're bankers. Bankers are poor. And uh, that she needs to go back to work. She quit her job the day before. That sucks. Whole different other topic. I'm kidding. But 
So what's interesting about this story is we were the stalking horse to get the approval, right, for ZenBank and SoFi to have access and get the roadmap built to get that access to a charter. Well, that didn't work out for SoFi, if you guys know their story. Not disparaging them, but for whatever reason, the FDIC said, no SoFi, you cannot have an industrial loan charter, a Blue Moon charter, a Red Sea charter, any charter you want at the time. They may get it now, good for them. And so they were declined, so ironically, Arcadi calls me back about two months later and says, hey, Eric, we still need to move the money through a charter. We don't want to buy you anymore, but can we partner with you? Well, that was all in 2015 leading to 2017, two years of my life. And what was great about that is we learned so much and the regulators learned so much because what they don't know scares them. And what they don't understand, they tend to squash, and, right? The regulator environment has changed dramatically in four years. So go back. And we have fantastic relations with the regulators. So I was like, cool, right? The car's back on. I'm going to get that house before it's sold. Life is good. So we call the regulators and say, hey, they want to partner with us. Can we move their money? And it's the same framework that we had already built all the board policies, procedures, risk tolerance levels, capital requirements, oversight, compliance, all the teammates we had hired, we were ready. The Fed came back and said to us, hey, maybe not so far, but go get another partner. And we're like, okay, so no worries. So we uh, gently pass on SoFi. In hindsight, that devastates me because now they're astronomically good company and doing great things, and I would have loved to have partnered with them. But you're dealt the hand you're dealt with with the Fed, right? Um, and it, I mean, it was all good. And, and if you guys know Mike Cagney at SoFi at the time, he's brilliant. He's now has another unicorn. And I mean, they're just maybe they were too big for us. Keep that in mind. This was our first one. So. We, one of the members, the CFO at ZenBank was a gentleman named Stefan Klee, who was the chief of staff at ING Direct with Arcadi, and who is now on my board, side note. He, he left ZenBank after it sold to SoFi and, and worked with the Power Corporation of Canada, and they have a billion dollar VC fintech fund in the US. And he said, hey, there's this company out of LA that needs a partner, Aspiration. So that started our path. We had one customer for two years. So from 2017 to 20, early 2019, the regulator said to us, slow and steady and let's test often. If you get in trouble with the regulators, you're in the penalty box for two years. If you're a de novo event, whatever you're doing, you're in the penalty box for two years. So when a lot of you say, why aren't there more banks jumping into this? Well, even if they jump into it, they can do one client for a period of time. And that's tough. If they're really good and have great partners with a nice regulator, maybe they can accelerate that in their first year, right? Times have come far from where when we started. You know, fast forward till today, we're at 28 partners. Uh, this is a tech conference, so I'm going to say one of our biggest partners is Carta. Many of you know them. We do a lot of work for them on the banking side. Um, I think if you go to their website or you can see it hidden in there somewhere that they say, hey, Coastal's pretty cool. Uh, I made Henry put that in there somewhere. That was part of our agreement. They, I'm just teasing. They have to disclose it legally. That's a regulatory thing. Um, but right, Cardas was one of our first and by far one of our bigger partners. We have four or five unicorns now that I think we work with. So we're super proud of those guys. Um, you know, if you step back, uh, look at that evolution. Words, systems, processes, and how I work with the regulators enables you guys to do what you do. And I, I have no idea what y'all do. I am IP lacking, right? So in our company has no programming, no stack, no desire to have a stack, no desire. We have APIs, but we don't use them outside of Carta. Weird story, but anyways, out of 28 programs. I'm, I'm that guy that you actually love and hate because I hand it off to people like him and others that know what they're doing. So when you work with Coastal, that's different than banks that have their own stack. Green Dot, Cross River, the Bancor, others, Meta, et cetera. They're really, really good banks. 
but that's not who we are. And we're not, the average community bank is not gonna be that way that they have your proudness, your ability to code and build something. There's just gonna be a community bank that knows banking, kinda knows lending, kinda knows deposits, knows customer service, and knows regulatory relations very well. We all have our PhD in reg relations. And so I think as you start down this journey and you go down this path, some of you already have partners because I know you in the audience. Um, And some of you are looking for partners and maybe thinking about how can I get my company, should they be thinking about partnering with a bank, what have you. You know, you have to weigh all this stuff in. And we'll get into it because we we are partnering with Sincere as well. Um, You know, launch next year, but just signing our LOI and going down this path. Um, But it's it's fascinating, you know. Sorry, Eric. Um, Go ahead, sorry. One of the things that's been really interesting is we sign, we've seen a bunch of new community banks get started in the last couple of months. And I think what's happened is, because of a lot of the work that the earlier banks have done, there's been an acceleration. So getting to that first FinTech is now sort of a three month cycle for the community banks, which is really great. And um, for those of you that are going to partner with a bank, knowing if they've done one or two programs first is actually really important because they're gonna actually know how to do it. And it's kind of silly, but there's like just mechanical stuff, not the least of which is just, are you a full member of MasterCard or Visa? And that alone is just 60 days of black hole. And what's, what's really interesting is the regulatory support that comes is, is helpful, but it's also very managed. And if you don't follow the rules, you get in trouble really quick. And, the, and trouble just means delay of game. Nothing at the beginning, there's, there's, there's nothing can go wrong because you haven't got any customers yet. But we're working with, I've worked with a bank where they actually got in somewhat similar sort of fashion to Eric, bought a charter from somebody, and the bank itself was in, in not great shape. And they said, hey, we're gonna go launch FinTech banking, which was great, we're, we'll partner with you and all of that. But they forgot to tell their regulators. And so the OCC came along and said, that's cool, we just need 90 days to think about it. And nothing's gonna happen in those 90 days, we're at day 68 and literally there's been no communication back and forth, but they just want their thinking time. So as you, as FinTechs, look for banks to partner with, it's really important to double check, have they done one before? Are they working with a platform? Are they gonna help you be successful? And then what you wanna start thinking about is like, what's the relationship between you and the bank and or the provider, like someone like us? And that's the program setup stuff. And I think, Eric, you've got a bunch of examples of different types of programs, but what might be interesting is to compare Aspiration, which is sort of this broker dealer type of model versus, uh, I don't know, Blue Vines, classic bank bank. Uh, And and listen to what Peter is telling you, too. Um, The team we have, which is probably 240 people that are dedicated to CCBX, they know some of the landmines, which is invaluable uh, to protect you and your company. And we're probably the most flexible out there. I'll just say that. We, We custom work with every fintech. I don't have a stack, so we say, great, how do you want to build it and then let us approve your system, not manage it, approve it, and then we're gonna validate it by testing you every so often that you're following what you said you were gonna do. Right, pretty simple stuff. Um, But to to go to your question, you know, Aspiration was our first. Uh, Good for them, they just announced their uh, deal, $2.3 billion valuation, IPO, and the de-spacking expected I don't know, let's call it November 1st. I don't want to hold that date, but good for them. They've worked really hard uh, to get where they're at and compare that to the small business one, Blue Vine, which we moved over Tuesday, as I mentioned. So uh, Aspiration, broker-dealer, checking savings, debit card with Coastal. And probably the biggest thing you'll learn with, this is in life, and when you get weirded out about stuff, just revert back to life, but the more you do something, the more confident you are, the more risk you're willing to take. So also working with your partner bank, the more experience they have, they understand how to kind of weave through stuff so they're a little bit more aggressive because they really do know where the landmines are and are not. Yeah, so there's a great example. So there's a couple of fintechs that want to do interesting things like bank people under the age of 18, which theoretically kids should have bank accounts. There's sort of copper and reasons why under 13 is challenging. But 13 to 18 is kind of an interesting market. And then there's a second variation of this, which is when you're going through KYC, uh, what if the person doesn't have any traditional documents like a social security number or something like that in the US? And 
if you can find the right bank, like Eric's bank, for example, they can be flexible about that. If they're first timing it, they're gonna be like, I don't know how to do that stuff. I'm, I'm not gonna take that risk. And so what you wanna do as you're thinking about which banks to work with is understand, have they been through the sorts of problems that you've been to before? And or are they on a flexible tech stack? We had one FinTech we've been working with where they said, we wanna customize the KYC flow. And the problem was the provider that they were gonna work with was hard-coded to the core banking system from FIS. And the challenge for that was they wanted to do a custom flow which wouldn't work with FIS, therefore the bank couldn't bank them. And so, Eric, maybe talk a little bit about like, how do you think about the money? Where, where does the money sit? And then what do you, what's in it for you? Why are you even doing this? Where's, do you want money? Do you want revenue? No, profits are bad. Come on, check society right now. All of us are in this for the greater good of society. Uh, not a single option holder here, I, I'm sure of it. Um, so, yes, 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 yes. Uh, know your bank. And that's what I, I love about Sinctaria is, hey, there are some things Coastal won't do. Just a statement. It's our board preference. It's our leadership style. It's our expertise. We have or have not. And so I love this whole matchmaking deal because that's just society too. That's what you do. You find the right fit for you. Um, and as we were talking about aspiration was consumer, Blue Vine is business. Till, who's my partner, is youth checking. And then we also have FAIR out of Houston, which is non-social security uh, based uh, immigrants. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, the, I mean, we have lots of distinct communities that cause us to be very creative. Let me tell you the economics. I mean, since you, yeah. you picked a big scab, right? Let's just say, talk about the money. How do you make money? Why do you do this? There are many levers from the bank perspective on why we do this. And again, you're going to hear the word from Coastal, flexible, 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 but has to be for a reasonable return to take the risk that we're talking about. Just has to be. If we're going to put our charter on the line and empower someone to deliver financial services to a community, has to be there. We get that. And, that, and, and our board has set pretty stringent le levels for that risk we're taking. So we grind on the business plan a lot. We look at the projections. You know, we, we've met with 1,200 fintechs. I've onboarded 28, 2% onboarding ratio. So no, it's tough. So the levers that you can pull in a financial discussion with the bank, obviously there's interchange on the debit card side as well as the credit card, but I'll explain that. On the debit card side, banks of my size enjoy what's called the Durban exemption, banks under 10 billion, we enjoy a higher interchange rate than banks over 10 billion. Just a statement, it's law, it got codified in Dodd-Frank. The big banks got screwed by the retailers. It happened, really set up our business. So you can rev share or split that interchange with the bank. Depends on you and your structure. Another lever, and I'll t somebody's going to ask me, well, what's an appropriate rev share, right? I, I get it. That's, that is the burning question. Let me go through this, and I'll tell you. Well, if it's with me, we get 50-50. No, I'm kidding. That's egregious. 40-60 is fine. No. So interchange. It's okay, man. It'll work out. It'll work out. <laughs> <laughs> He's right here. i got to be cautious. So interchange, obviously, there is some margin. If you bring us deposits, we do earn Today, nothing on deposits, zero. They're actually a liability. We don't like them. It's, it's unbelievable I'm saying that. I'm sweeping deposits off my balance sheet by the billions right now. I don't need them, right? The government just put $6 trillion of deposits in the market. All banks are flush, so you're not going to get a lot there. In two to three years, I think deposits are going to be valuable, and you will be able to talk with your bank partner about splitting some of the margin. The other half of margin are the bank assets or the loans. If you produce loans, is the bank as true lender, which is a whole different other two-hour session, if the bank is the true lender and going to balance sheet it, they have capital issues they need to be paid for. Return, risk-adjusted return on capital, RARock is what we look at. And so those numbers tend to be 25 to 40 percent RARock. And we're going to ask for credit enhancements from the fintech. Going on, we have monthly minimums to cover our cost until you launch or if you're not successful. Because it's, I'm still running you the charter, I gotta get monthly minimum revenue from you as a FinTech because I have to hire people. I onboard you as a company, I hire three to five people that do nothing but work with your company. 
and we're not going to lose money on you, right? So I'm going to make you cover that staffing cost in one way, shape, or form. So we, we, and there are other ways that you can look at this stuff. We have embedded some of our products with our fintechs, and I will take less interchange because I'm selling more direct product, right? You can skin this cat many different ways. No, All right, God, Eric. that's awful. Eric, what is the, what's the rev share? <laughs> Put the number out there. So if it, on average of average, of average, yeah, yeah, I know. On average of average of average, yeah, I'm, I'm dead. So, um, you know, if, if, if the bank were to take somewhere about that 20%-ish as a starting conversation of the interchange, give or take, and then whether or not they charge a per item fee or not, because Visa does, and then on the deposit side, depending upon what type of products you're pushing through, if there's overdrafts, the banks incur fees and stuff, so there may be fees on that side. Um, you know, and I say average on average, each bank is so different. Some banks will say to you, great, I don't want any of the interchange, I'm flat fee only, and here's our cost, it's 250000 a quarter, or 200000 a month, or $4 million a year, right? Depending upon the size of your program, what volume you're gonna, because they say, we're just going to pass it all through to you. And I don't want to deal with the accounting. I'm flat fee based. Uh, some banks will keep loans and won't. You know, you've got to find the right partner. It goes back to everything Peter is talking about here. You have to find the right partner. Some fintechs will come to us and say, man, I'm a startup. I only raised $2 million. And, right, and, and humbly I say, I get it. So what we can do is a higher interchange lower fee income, lower margin, because there's nothing to split there. And we rev sure more on the beneficial side, and I'll ask them for a longer contract. I'll ask them for a seven-year agreement versus a three- or five-year deal. Because I'll say, okay, I, I like what Sincere's doing, but it's going to be a slow ramp, and I can't fee them to death in the beginning. They can't afford it. They're a startup. They're at seed capital, maybe A round, and they raised five, ten million. And so we'll work. So that's why I said it, it's so all over the board. You just have to talk with your bank and work with Peter, et cetera, and, and say, okay, how can we build this? What's, what's the glide plane for both, knowing that both parties have got to win and both parties are shooting to be there in seven years? And that's humbly what we try to remember, too, is you're our partner. You're our customer. We need to treat you with kit gloves. And we, we, we've had 100% success Right? Our partners make it. We make sure the gating criteria, they're set up to win. But at the same time, we're, we're going to fight like hell to make sure you're successful and we'll do whatever we have to do. Uh, did you get 20%? That's all. No, <laughs> we didn't get that. Um, I just want to add something very controversial here. Um, there's a lot of fintech or neobank startups that's going around. I don't know who, you know, not knowing where you're from. Um, the way we approach it is this. Um, if your business is relying just on the interchange, I wouldn't even start it, uh, to be truly honest with you, because we think um, there is only, uh, it's, yeah, uh, as Eric mentioned, you know, there's only so much you squeeze out the interchange, um, and everyone's going for that, right? Um, where there is aspiration or the chime of the well. Um, so sincere, we, we went for, from a different route. Um, at best, the way we look at interchange, it's, it'll cover our operational costs. Um, our model is actually slightly different, but. Um, that's something that I would personally talk about. It's not focused too much in the, on the interchange. If you are, then there's probably a, something broken in your business model or, or where you're heading towards. Um, anyhow, so I think, no, I, I, and I I think I wanna, that's dead on. So hang I, on, I want to add on to that and sure. say, if you come to Coastal and say, we're going to live on interchange, we won't bank you. So I want to reiterate exactly what he said. That it has proven that that's not sustainable enough. So we're looking for other things that the company has planned to cross-sell or fee-based or subscription-based or, um, you know, their core model. I mean, obviously, Carta, right, has a core company outside of their banking services that we're not worried about them making it. Uh, Aspiration has their uh, e ESG funds and their investment broker-dealer business. Elevest has their female mentoring and, and broker-dealer business. So we agree wholeheartedly with you. You need to have a robust plan when you go to your bank partner that says, this is how diversified we are because banks are diversified and we expect you to be too. We want you to be here in five, seven years to where if there's a hit to one of your income streams, the others can still flourish. I think the takeaway for 
uh, all of you as builders is if you think you can live on interchange alone, you're going to find some banks that just say, we don't believe you, and or we know it will fail, and or you're going to realize pretty quickly into that journey that you actually need to do something else. And the something else is you should start with interchange because it's the easiest product to get to market, which is the debit card in a consumer's hand, whether it's small business or consumer. But then you need to really look at like product differentiation, whether it's subscriptions, um, which in the old banking days we might have called an account maintenance fee. It's uh, surprising like, how subscriptions sound more palatable. But you can get away with five to 10 bucks a user per month for different unlocks of services, like more kid controls, for example, on kid cards and stuff like that. Or the metal debit card for reals, people will pay 10 bucks a month for it. Don't ask me. Just fair warning, metal debit cards cost about 50 bucks to make. So you won't actually earn your money back until they've been there for six months. But anyway, but what's really critical is you've got to follow the journey of your customers who most likely will at some point say, I need some sort of lending of some kind, whether it's something simple as an overdraft, and you could give away overdrafts for free, or you could just say, for $5 a month, we'll let you go negative $200, and there's no fees. So you can use your subscriptions revenue to power your overdraft. Then you're going to get to a point where someone's going to want some sort of line of credit. And then ultimately, the evolution will be some sort of secured credit or credit product, if you're following the journey of your customers. And that's pretty natural. After that, then you're literally just following the Citibank playbook from the late 90s, which was, let's buy a broker. They bought Smith Barney, and they added investing into the core of Citi. And then they said, let's buy insurance, and they bought Travelers. And literally, that's the playbook of every consumer journey with their bank. What's interesting about um, most of the millennials is they're quite comfortable having narrow cast banks for the different use cases of their life. So there will be plenty of people that will be delighted to get a debit card with the face of their dog or cat on it and um, have super experiences of being able to fund or support you know, a sick dog or whatever. And that's a very specialized use case. There are plenty of people that want to align with LGBTQ and be in that universe. And it's not uncommon for multiple bank existences to happen. Where the paycheck goes is really the home bank for most folks. Um, and so what you want to do is also figure out how to do payroll switching pretty early on into this flow. That being said, Eric, when you were considering like, how to do this with the bank, you effectively had three choices. Directly connect it to your core banking system. Use some sort of FBO structure, and maybe you want to explain what that feels like to the fintechs here or use someone like Unit or Treasury Prime or Syncterra to be the front door to this functionality? How did you think about it? Yeah, so pick your partner well, and, and just to reiterate what Citibank example, make sure your partner will grow multiple products with you up front. Because the last thing you want is multiple banks as partners, and then you got to KYC and put your customer through that process twice and the expense twice. So if they have their checking account, it should be very easy to lend to them security-wise, compliance-wise. You've already done all that work, so just think about that. Um, yeah, so at Coastal, I, I have mentioned that we have API, APIs built direct to our core, which is FIS. And I have found FIS to be a adequate partner. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning it, it costs us 300 grand in about nine months to get rudimentary, I think we, we built like 15 or 20 APIs, right, for all the basic product categories. And their maintenance of those is adequate. Um, and all good stuff, right, whatever. But what we really found is, knowing again, our bank's competencies, and it's not programming, it's not building a stack, it's not having the IP uh, in-house, is working in an FBO or uh, omnibus structure, which is basically, let me give the example of Aspiration. So Aspiration has millions of customers. At Coastal, physically at Coastal, Aspiration has six to eight checking accounts with us. And all millions of their customers reside in one account. And we are custodian on their behalf, right? The banking laws basically give me the power to custodian things. 
That's what we do. We hold your money on your behalf. That's the definition of it. But in this case, we algamate all of their customers into one account. And then the second account next to that is the net settlement account through Visa or MasterCard. We sponsor on both networks. If it matters, make sure your bank that you're going to partner with through Peter, say, I have to have a Visa bank. Okay, right? We do that or MasterCard. Then we have a net settlement account. And so we, that account does the actual payment systems, wire account, you know, and then the, the fee-based operating accounts for aspiration, et cetera. But the beauty of this and the simplicity of this and working, we, we think of it working with somebody like Peter is the reconciliation, the billing, the compliance and data management, that, that boring banking stuff, the GLs, right the ledger that reconciliation does it balance at the end of the day at the end of the month all of that stuff you we have found it best to partner with somebody that can build that for us and society has matured enough that you guys as fintechs or as partners or as middleware companies or as tech companies Right, the ecosystem is robust enough that you can build this today outside pretty easily. Four years ago when we were doing it, it was a little bit more challenging because there wasn't the full ecosystem that there is today. So, and the omnibus structure is also easiest too. It, for the fintech perspective, right, we don't have to uh, assign and work with them on one customer at a time at Coastal, and this is Coastal's perspective. Right, we house them in an omnibus account. It also makes them portable for the fintechs because it's not my account number. It's their account number. They will use my routing number, but oh, God bless you, a question. Just repeating the question for the video and stuff like that. So the question is, what happens to things like FDIC insurance and so forth when you have an omnibus account? Because it's per account and that doesn't seem to work. So Eric. Yeah. No, no, great question. So the, the way the FDIC works and the way their rules work is I am officially the custodian and at the end of every single night, I need to know how much money is in Eric Sprink's account. And I have to be able to demonstrate every single night at close of business how much he has. Thus, the reconciliation payment systems and all of that stuff really matters because I'm legally obligated for the FDIC insurance fund to have accurate records at any moment in time, really. Um, so great question. But if we so, follow sorry, those just rules... To, just to close the loop. So bottom line, you still get FDIC insurance as long as you actually have a legit ledger that keeps track of everything. Yep. And, and, and this is an interesting question to get into the legal tease. If you follow that same thought that I'm keeping, really, at the end of the day, I'm keeping the master ledger. It's being provided to me, but I have it, and we reconcile to it, or try most times, is these are also legally Coastal's customers. And that's an important distinction. Economically, there are partners' customers. Branding, there are partners' customers. I never want to talk to our partners' customers. Heaven forbid our phone number ever leaks out, they start calling us. Well, I don't have the staff to handle their customer service. So we hide. We like hide as small as we can. And we really, we never advertise our partners. We don't tell anybody about our partners. We don't, we don't want to. But legally, they're ours. That means also compliance, blowback from regulatory issues, CFPB, all of that stuff is legally mine too. So there's benefits, think, but there's drawbacks. Yeah. So I think what, what Eric's trying to say is, uh, Eric has the objective, which is to make sure that the, a customer account is treated like a real bank account in the real world, even if it's being operated by a FinTech such as you. And what you'll wanna do as you're getting a relationship with one of your banks is make sure you're doing the right setup at the beginning of who's gonna do what, what the relationships are, and that sort of thing. And that governance model actually drive a lot of the behavior. And the closer you can be to your bank, the more likely you're gonna be able to get out of a jam when something happens. Um, and the further away you are from your bank, the more indirect the relationship will be, and it'll be harder for you to actually influence anything, because the governance will be out of your control. So focusing on that, I think the last thing we'd sort of focus in on 
when you're getting started as a bank is all the policies and procedures. And the reason these matter is because even as recently as last week or two weeks ago, the Fed published a set of rules for the bank to say, here are the following 25 things you have to do around due diligence of a fintech. You have to make sure they can pay their bills. You have to make sure that they have done some kind of security audit of some sort. You've got to make sure that somebody is looking after money laundering. You heard Angela talking about that earlier. The reality is you're required to make sure between you that money laundering is not occurring. The liability is on Eric, so Eric is going to be watching every transaction, even if somehow you choose not to. And Eric's going to be focused in on making sure that you're monitoring yourselves for fraud as well. So governance, compliance, policies, and procedures all then flow down into what your relationship with your bank is. And that's why setting these things up at the beginning becomes really important. Then operationally, this is the part that's not often thought about with, with you guys as fintechs. There is, in fact, operational work. The easiest stuff is out of your KYC funnel, 10 to 15, maybe even as high as 20% will fail. And they're going to fail for simple things like first name, last name matches and all of that sort of stuff. They're going to fail because maybe this person, uh, unbeknownst to you, is a politically exposed person. So they're related to Trudeau in Canada, for example. And all of those instances are going to require someone to make a decision. And if you don't care about growth, your decision can be just, screw it, we won't bank them. Uh, at some point, you're going to say, hey, actually, I want those other 20% of people that are failing the KYC funnel. And then you're going to want to work with the bank and either decide on, can you accept Fred and Freddie are the same person? Or how do you go and do enhanced due diligence? And all of that engagement, again, comes back to how your relationship is with your bank. And it becomes really important that you establish upfront what are you going to do, who's going to do it. And the, the last and most important thing is, at the end of every business day, Eric has to report to the Fed what's the balance. But most of you are going to create money as part of your startup. So if you're lucky, you got a VC that said, here's $25 million, use it for growth. And the standard playbook for that is, give five, get five. Or in some cases, give 50, get 50. Which means at the end of a business day, let's say on the 1st of July, you offer $500 for every new account that signs up. That's money that has to come from somewhere. And it's not coming from the consumer. It's coming from one of your uh, account reserves with Coastal. And at the end of the business day, the, the Fed account that's in his FBO is going to be short 500 times the number of consumers that were added to the bank. And so you all have to then agree to reconcile, and that becomes quite problematic if you haven't done it. So don't assume there's no operational components. Don't assume Eric's going to do it all for you, because he's not. He's, he's going to do as little as possible. He's going to make you do as much as you can. And pick your partner bank based on the reality of, hey, at the end of the business day, we know what to do and how to talk to each other. Then there's all the regular day-to-day -day stuff of did my payments go through and so on. And if you're doing it yourselves directly to Eric, that's a big burden. It's non-trivial to keep track of even something as basic as did the ACH file show up and did it get delivered on time. Last and not least is customer support. And believe it or not, customer support is regulated too. And you can't just go around sending people's credit card numbers in emails and stuff like that. Um, and Eric as a bank will have an obligation to make sure you're doing it correctly because it's really his customers when it comes from the law's perspective. And so one of the things you're going to have to think about pretty quickly as you start to launch is who's going to do customer support. And it can't just be an engineer. Just I, I know you're all engineers, but you, you just can't answer the phone because you're going to say the wrong thing, and someone's going to get in trouble from a compliance perspective. There are a number of firms like uh, Ubiquity and others that will do it on your behalf. And they'll do it way better than you could ever do it. So my strong encouragement is don't do your own customer support. Pay someone to do it, because you'll stay, save a lot of jail time. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the question for, the, for the everyone's benefit was, if, you've, if you're an existing company and you've got a customer support team that's doing uh, support for your existing products, what do you do next and, and what can you do? So the answer is, like uh, at, at Uber, for example, with Uber Money, we scaled up a dedicated pod within the customer care team that was specifically trained on bank rules. And in some cases, we actually uh, used third parties, but we had them go into special clean rooms where you couldn't take photos of pictures of the balances and all of those sorts of things. 
which are constraints that your customer care team can grow into and learn about. But it's fairly prescriptive. Hire someone who's worked at customer support from FinTech or bank, and then you can scale up your teams. And if you have an existing team, dedicating some folks to doing it is good. What you won't be able to easily do is fungibly move one team member from another part of the customer care team, because they won't have all the uh, experience yet of what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. And, that, and that's just a learning curve. You can, ultimately, you can get there. It's just, what are you going to do next? Yeah, and let me just add one more bank slant on it, because I'm here, is make sure you have that stuff pretty much in hand before you approach the bank. Mm -hmm. We're flexible, and we'll say, OK, let's keep talking. But you have, it's kind of like VC and asking for money. When you're asking a bank to give you a charter, have your pitch perfect. Have your book perfect. And the part that you need to sell the bank on is this boring stuff. And here's our customer service team. Here's how they've, where they've been trained. Here's our compliance officer. Legal is involved. We have a former banker, right? And then we can give the bro hug to the guy, and, right? It, it matters. So you have one chance. We're looking at 10 to 15 fintechs a week. We onboard two to three a quarter. So I, that's my only advice. Great question. Find a pattern, your system, then talk to your bank partner. All right, so switching gears, let's talk to, Eric, uh, to Robert about like, what his journey was, which started in February of this year, right? Yes, right. Um, before I start, can I get a show of hand to s see who's in the process of starting a FinTech or exploring doing a FinTech so that I'm telling my Okay, so I'm trying to keep it then uh, super high level then. Um, so yeah, so, so basically, um, so, so one of the things is, um, so I have a super tech background, I actually code. Um, so when I first exploring FinTech, and I have no background in FinTech at all, I come from a consumer background, B2C, Walmart, and you know, some of the social spaces. So I saw obviously that, oh, FinTech is growing, we could do car issuance, just like that, people are advertising it, you know, come on our platform, just do it. Um, so naively, we, we launch, right? We launch our wait list, we put the site up, we talk to these folks, um, and that's when it hit us, right? Being tech folks, our team's very uh, deep tech. Um, we start touching it, and it was just coming, from, it was just horrific. So we just thought, oh my God, these, are people, these people are looking after our money, and yet the, the tech was pretty, uh, pretty down. So with that in place, um, you know, we launched, so there's nothing, we can't go back. So, what I mean, so we essentially launched a website with a whitelist, so people signing up. Um, in the meantime, we're exploring technologies. So we went through a few partners, actually. Um, a lot of the sort of the user suspect that says, we do instant issuance, we do this. Um, and what it turns out, a lot of them were really sort of white label. Um, and the way I would look at this is, um, especially folks who build, you know, we always talk about doing MVP, build it quick, launch it quick. Um, so I since realized that MVP in the fintech world means something totally different, like 12 months, 16 months, you know, um, that's how it is. So that's essentially when we start thinking from a company standpoint, what does it mean as an MVP, right? Do we go with some sort of white label uh, product to, and then eventually move to a, uh, a bigger platform like Sintera. Um, it just worked out at the end of the day that it did not make sense to do what we call a traditional MVP, launch something and then have those users and accounts move over. And that's basically what, what we did. We, we, we start thinking about maybe we think the MVP stage. Um, so launch something maybe with basic functionality and then grow it, you know, and then add it on as we grow. And essentially, that's where we are. We um, hey, really lucky. Robert, when you when you were setting this up, were you thinking about creating a set of shell APIs, things for your own use, like create a card, and then under the covers you were going to call whatever provider, or were you already hard coding into one stack? Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So we, at the beginning, we knew we wanted to do something that's sort of agnostic on our side. So meaning we could just plug and play uh, vendors. And that's just because some of the vendors we, at the early stage when we found out how they did things were, just did not felt right for us. Um, and right, so, so that's exactly it. So, so we essentially built uh, our own layer on top of the different platform that's out there and then switch 
uh, based on the functionality and based on sort of the, where the technology are. Um, the other key thing is this, we also have a long-term view. So what we found when we spoke with some of these other partners was the thinking was very short term. So, you know, white label. White label is great, but it only takes you so far. Um, and the other aspect is, you know, we, we talk about interchange. Yeah, forget about interchange. If you w work with, um, you, know, another you know, another party sort of sitting in the middle there. So from a, there's, there's many things that did not, just did not seem right. If we were going to take this business for a long term perspective. I mean, it's great if you're going to try something out for a couple of months. Um, but when we start thinking about we're in it for the long, long run, then we decided, to, okay, we really need to go directly to something that we could, that will ride with us for the long vision. Um, and that, that's basically it. Um, yeah, obviously we're not going to build it on our own because we're not a fintech expert. We are expert at the consumer side, so we're really good at attracting users. Um, one of the slides mentioned, right, we've already have like 17,000 on waitlist right now. So we're really good at sort of selling to the, to the end consumers. Um, but we're also uh, sort of a technology focused guy. So we're not as great on the operational side. And this is where folks like Sinteria comes into play. They not only provide a platform for us, but they were also educate, educating us along the way too, right? So, um, so that everything just fit into place. Um, and then when Coastal came along, the other great thing was they, they were really focused on less about transactional, they were really thinking about where we're going too. So, so, every, you know, so rather than, oh, hey, we want your money now. Um, great, what you're doing is great, but give us this money. But they were not like that at all. They were thinking from the long-term perspective. Um, we see where you're going. We can help you. And Eric did mention earlier that, great, you guys do not have the you know, $40, $50 million in funding. But you get there, right? Um, or, or your business will get there. But here's what we could do for you. So that was one of the refreshing things that we saw too, versus some of the others that we saw with a very transactional base. Um, and what that means is, I'll uh, give you an example, right? Here's the upfront free before you even start your business, right? It's, it's this catch-22 problem that we saw. Um, in some cases, you know, tech folks here, they were charging us user sandbox. Um, and it was unheard of. I, I, you know, I was asking these folks, it's like, yeah, we're new to FinTech because this is something that's normal. And they said it was. Yeah. I, I still do not know if that is normal in the FinTech world that you, get, you have to pay to use a sandbox. But, um, so, yeah, so, so the other thing is it's some of the operational stuff, right? Um, KYC, fraud. Um, we did not want to do that ourselves, meaning we don't want to build it ourselves or work with another party. And, so we all, when we looked at different partners, technology partners, we wanted a, um, a partner that could take care of that for us. Um, to a certain point, there are certain things we want to control too in terms of what data gets passed through. But um, that was one of the things that we, we took into account, how much heavy lifting that the partner's gonna do for us and what we can do and what we could focus on. Um, and, and that's another thing too, thinking about what we're good at and what we're not good at. So we're trying to, it's the classic case of hiring for your weakness, right? So, so in, that's how we look at the partners too. We look at partners that are filling the holes for us. Um, yeah, so, I, so that's more at the high, high level in terms of how we chose. And then obviously when we started working with Sintera, we got introduced to um, Coastal, to Eric, and that's when the relationship started beginning. Um, and that sort of helped us, it's where we are today, right? We're, we're building the product now with support from, from both sides. When you were thinking about getting started, did you think to yourself, did you even know that you needed all these different partners, like KYC partner, fraud partner, ledger, all that stuff? No, um, we joined the Kuwait, right? FinTech has changed. Um, it's easy to, to just launch, launch a product, Neo banks everywhere. Um, you know, I mean, obviously we know in hindsight that's not true. Um, so yeah, so we actually thought, and, and to be honest with you, when, when, we, when I started looking into the area to, to launch a Neo bank to play, um, I, I saw teams that spent 12 months and 18 months building their product, and I was just laughing to my friends, like, wow, we, we're going to do this in three months, right? <laughs> Coming from the world where we came from, where you got to launch an MVP in three months. Um, so we were that naive, um, uh, so, and we drank into everyone's Kuwait. So I think my, my advice is really dig and kick the tires if you are choosing a partner. Um, both from the operational side and what heavy lifting they could do and 
what they're selling and what they're doing. Um, so that, that's sort of where, where we came, came in. And I think from a speed perspective, so when, I was running, when we were running Uber Money, we had a huge BD team, a huge legal team, and even with that team, it took us nine months to sign up all the different partners and vendors and do due diligence on them and all of that sort of stuff. And I, most of you won't have 15 people in BD that can sit there and negotiate with the different KYC vendors to decide which is the best price. And so what you want to think about is how quickly can you get in the customer's hands the experience to then iterate on it? Because the MVP is really the basic of a deposit account. And then all the extended stuff, lending, subscriptions, insurance, all those things are your actual product. But it's not until you have all of those things together that you'll really know it's working. And the cost for getting started is the thing you want to minimize, both in contract law and, and all of that stuff, but also just like, you know, do you have one tech stack? So the difference between all of these providers is they're all approaching how to build and how to think about customers in different ways. And if you want to be the integrator across all of those, that's great. But just assume you're going to need way more engineers in order to do that. It's just a bigger lift. So we talked a little bit about this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So it's a great question. So just to repeat it, so Robert, what's your strategy around rewards and loyalty and if you buy this, do you get that outcome type of thing? Yeah, CLOs is its whole thing. Yeah. Right. So, so I think um, the way to think about sincere is so, so maybe I take a step back. Why we actually even approach this this space. Um, so pet space, from a business perspective, check all the boxes, right? It's, it's this year's $100 billion, and they, they reckon it's going to double in five years. Like, we're talking about $200 billion. So in terms of addressable market, is there. Um, in terms of price and sensitive, in terms of people spending on their pets, it's also there. So that's, from a business perspective, it makes a lot of sense to, to, talk, um, to attack that. But when you look at it, innovation there, zero. I mean, apart from food um, and medicines, there's no fintech innovation at all. Now, when you look at the $100 billion market, everyone else requires a transaction. And that means you know, there's someone sitting in the middle there making that transactions. Now, on the other side, from the, um, one of the things we would think about, we're actually a B2B company. So what that means is the merchants, if you think about if you are like Chewy, um, pet smart or if you were to launch a new pet product you have nowhere to go to really to acquire users you go to the Facebook you go to the Google right so but they're spending a lot of money in those channels um, for example Chewy um, is, is a good yeah one of the retailers doing that so when we looked at that it's rather than having them spend that money is think about if we are able to get a very targeted focus audience then rather than spend that money in to, to a middleman, we could share that money between ourselves and their target users. And that is essentially what, what we're doing, right? And this is where the rewards comes in. Um, so one of the interesting things is when we launched the, the site, the waitlist, we actually didn't have to do that much BD. They came to us and said, this is it. We know what you're doing. Take it. We'll give you this percent. We'll give you that percent. Um, and one of the other thing too, you think about the cons, you know, why this works in the fintech world. Traditionally, affiliate marketing is really about a code, right, uh, or a link. That is really broken today. Now, on the flip side, if we're able to say, just look at transaction data, we know our users came to you. So, as a merchant, now you don't have to do anything, right? We're able to drive that data to you. Um, so that's sort of the short-term view, but we're actually looking at even a bigger view in terms of, as we go forward, if any of you, you know, who own dogs and cats, you understand how expensive they are. Um, there's a lot of those areas that we could get into now that we become this. Um, you could think of us as sort of the middleman between the merchants and the consumers, right? But yet we're rewarding the consumers, which is something, you know, that the consumer wants. Um, so that's how we have sort of 
put in those cash back, the rewards. And this goes back to the interchange, why we're actually not a big, you know, we, we don't rely on the interchange, going back to the earlier questions, because we get enough percentage points from the, um, from the merchants. So one way to think about it, so from a tech stack point of view, having good categorization of your transactions so that all the pet stores look like pet stores and stuff like that is really valuable. And so folks like MX and others can help make sure your data stream is clean. Um, you'll kill yourself if you try and track every merchant ID at the mid of every store. It's not going to work. So you're going to want to have someone transacting or cleaning up your transaction data so then you can offer rewards based on cashback, based on the type of merchant. If you're directly connected or you have a relationship with the merchant, even better because you can get receipt level data and other sorts of insights. And what's really unique about um, in retail in general is the people with the margin are the manufacturers. Uh, the retailers themselves don't have any ma margin. They're like a 2% business. But if you're Procter & Gamble and those sort of folks, they have 15, 20, 30%, which is where all the, gift, the coupons that you get when you go to the grocery store come from. And if you can pipe your way into that flow like uh, Robert's planning to do, then you can pass on those benefits onto your consumers in the form of cashback. Yeah, and the other thing too, um, why focusing on a niche is also very good. Um, so, so um, I, I come from a big, sort of big data background. The, you know, there is a theory that when you, you have too much data, when it becomes noise. So, when, but when you go for a niche, you have very clean and focused data. So what that means is we could do a lot of processing on our side. So um, at some point, we we're going to start using machine learning to understand the health of your pet, right? Just based on your spending habits. So there are insights that we could potentially do with that data. And this goes back to if you were like Chase, that transaction covers food and restaurant. It's, it's really, really busy and noisy. So while if, if you were to go for a niche, there's already a lot of variable that you removed out of that equation. So that's also something that's really, really, I think, um, we start gonna see in the future in the next few years. So very focused. Um, and, the, and the plus side of that is the transaction size that for, for the pets. Pet parents, typical transaction size are over $50. So for us, it's not even about volume anymore. It's more about the transaction value. And if you were to look at interchange, again, that, that's, you, know, that's a, you get a higher uh, base point out of that because, just for, because of the transaction size. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So very, very summarizing here, or not very summarizing. In summary, we've got, I think the, the main thing you, you want to focus on as a fintech is finding that bank partner that actually gets your business and wants to align with your success. And um, I think the best partnerships will survive all of the worst outcomes. So you will get fraud, full stop period, you will be attacked. And it doesn't matter how good you think your fraud platform is, you will get fraud and it will suck. And then if your bank doesn't like the fact that you're not doing anything about the fraud, you'll get debanked really quickly. So good relationship with your bank is probably the, the most critical thing. And know that there's always going to be a challenge of um, a bad transaction for money laundering, example. They will happen. And it's not that you can't prevent, you, you, you're not obligated to prevent them all. What you are obligated to do is make sure you actually have good process to attempt to detect them. And collaborating with your bank to make sure that you've aligned on a strategy for how to look at every transaction, make a judgment. You could make a bad judgment, that's okay. But not making a judgment and not even looking at the transactions doesn't work. And you'll get debanked and or regulated against in very short order. So my takeaway is like it's really cool for um, banks like Coastal to be opening up the doors to all of you. And um, I think over time, There'll be more and more uh, community banks in the marketplace, which is really cool. And then uh, our goal is to take the 12 months or 18 months of time that Robert and team are thinking about to build a fintech down to really that sort of three-month mark. And the way we'll get there is we're going to actually copy a little bit of Wade's playbook and open source mobile and web banking, and that will be the jump-off point. So instead of starting from scratch with an empty panel of code, You'll start with a fully developed mobile banking app that you can customize, change, do whatever you want with it. And that should accelerate things even further. And if you don't like what we built, I don't care. Go build your own. But it should make it faster for you. So I think net-net, 
The building versus buying thing is the really critical decision that you're going to make. You can build all of this stuff. I had a big team at Uber, 100 plus engineers. We built a pretty, pretty awesome product. We also had the reg regular mothership company to support. But if your real goal is to manage your community and to have that insight that you have about what it takes to build for your consumers, spend less time building and spend more time buying or acquiring tech or open sourcing tech and get into the business of getting the product that you want into the customer's hands as quickly as possible. Because all of the insights that you think you have are invalid until you actually try it in the real world. And it, and it feels really natural. People are going to swipe and try and save money for uh, you know, care.com loans to help their pet ownership. But until you actually try it and you take the friction out of it and see what people are doing, you don't know if you've got it quite right. And you, you'd be optimizing for the wrong thing. And as with most of these sorts of models, it is possible to do an MVP. The problem is the basic lift to get out the door is reasonably high. And so buying that basic lift and then focusing on your consumer understanding is where I think most of you should spend your time. So that's my takeaway. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts. Silence is golden. All right. So that's it in a nutshell. Uh, we can do a few more questions if you guys have any. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can wrap up. Yeah, over in the back. So I think um, in, in general, there's a, a concept that you want to have, which is a stratification of the wait list. So the top 100 people get the best thing. The top next 500 people get the next thing. And you jump up and down the queue based on how many referrals you make. And so the classic one that many fintechs are following is, we'll give you our first metal debit card for free. And everybody else has to pay 60 bucks a month. But there could be lots of different games. Yeah, I think for us, obviously, the referral to move up the list. Um, but what we actually found, which surprised us too, was if you have a, if you you have a very if you have the product, people are just signing. Um, that's what happened with us when we launched a site. We thought we had to gamify all the different things. Um, I mean, it worked initially, um, but over time that waitlist grew just because there was a product that people wanted. Um, we got a lot of word of mouth and just grew from there. Um, so I, I think it really depends what. Um, what, you know, what your target is. Because the other thing you've got to think about, about clean referrals and actual real referrals. So one aspect that we test consistently, it's yes, we have this wait list, but how of them are actually valid? Um, because friends will put their friends' email in just for the sake of moving up that list. So, and then you get the friend coming back, I never signed up for this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we do that through things like um, email, you know, newsletters, and we find out we get you know, almost 50% open rate, which is also unheard of. Typically, it's around 30%. So, which tells us that the, the, you're yeah, going to, to um, product market fit. Just without actually launching a product, we saw there's a need for this. So, w I would say if, it really depends what your goal is of that list, the size of that list. Um, if, if, so, think about that, right? Because sometimes you could cheat, right? You could buy users, the other thing. Um, but at some point, you need to convert those users too. So, um, so we know that we, we've got certain signals that's, that makes us, you know, that we sort of put more, more fuel into the fire type, type of approach. Yeah. Some fintechs are doing things like incremental cash back, so like 5% if you're in the top 100 referrers, that sort of thing. But when you do anything that involves money, Eric has to say yes. And you actually have to do it, because then you'll have the FTC on your bottoms. And that's unpleasant. No one likes the FTC. Well, everyone likes the FTC, but no one wants to meet the FTC yeah, or something. It, and this goes back to one thing we didn't talk about is active users. Um, mm. You may have someone signed up for a card, but if they're not actively using the card, that is another issue too, right? Because you're paying for that person to hold that card, hold that account. Um, we were concerned about that initially, but the more we, you know, our wait list grew and the more we survey our users, we, we, we found that oh, that's not the case. Right? We don't have to pay them $5 to so and so. In some cases, we've had users saying, we don't want the cash back. Give the money to you know, a, a pet shelter. 
So we, we're getting certain signals from that to having that wait list, which helps us to sort of drive what we want to be when we, re you know, when we launch the card. Yeah, I think that's what's really interesting, Eric. Oh, sorry, Robert. The, the alignment of the interests is actually a, a key benefit that can happen. So uh, various folks that have done products for the environment have done things like, you know, the more referrals you do, the more trees will plant, that sort of thing. And so aligning the end game of the usage pattern that you want with the behavior of the type of consumer that you want to have actually is quite valuable. Uh, in the back. Yeah, so I think one of the interesting challenges that you'll have as a fintech is if your wait list was 1 million and not 13,000, would the bank that you start with actually know what to do with a million customers? And most of the community banks will say, that's awesome, until they look at it and they say, that's kind of scary. Um, because I, you know, most of the community banks that are in the market, their own operational skills are designed to grow organically with the, the the products and the fintechs that they're supporting. So huge jumps of volume and load become interesting. Yeah, and let me add on to that. So interesting, so Greenwood out of Atlanta's uh, up and coming black and brown bank that's planning on launching, I believe October, but they have like 1.3 million on their wait list. And we're, and we're humble and proud to be their bank behind them. Um, but what, picking your right bank partner we have so many partners, we have models built on staffing levels, call centers, how many uh, reg E disputes there's going to be. How, we actually have so much data that we can add back to our partners to say, hey, and we base it on 100,000 households, if you just want to know what we do. And for every 100,000 households, you need two FTE for this, you need two FTE for call center, you need two FTE for this and we're able to provide them. So that's something to think about with a partner too, is especially if you think you're gonna scale or really grow really fast, make sure you have an experienced bank that that's not gonna freak out. Yeah, I think that's right. And now Eric- or, or the regulators freak out. So now Eric, put your hands over your ears. If you want a second bank, you can do that. <laughs> Some banks will say, you gotta be exclusive with us. Um, but many banks will say, it's cool, you can have half of your accounts with us and half of with another. So let me address that. <laughs> Coastal is exclusive only, just I'm that guy. But it's actually a, it's a legal demarcation that mm -hmm. the FDIC has drawn. If the partner is exclusive with Coastal, mm -hmm. legally we can count those as core deposits, not brokered deposits. In the regulatory framework, Brokered deposits are deemed riskier and more expensive. And if a bank has more than 10% of its deposits in brokered, then our insurance costs even go up. I, I didn't make the rule. I think it's stupid. And we do partner with other banks. It just depends on the partner. Um, but really, we try not to because there are some legal financial implications to it as well. And that's just on the deposit side. That's the only time it comes into play. I think that's right. And it's also important, like some banks will be good for deposits but not for loans. And so when you're picking a tech stack provider such as us, you want to double check, do I have to get all my products with one bank and therefore does it limit the number of banks I can talk to as a result? Or can I mix and match and say, this bank is awesome for credit cards, but they're not great at deposits and so forth. So when you start to scale, organic scale is pretty natural. All the banks will grow with you pretty naturally. If you're starting from a big number, you may want to, from the get-go, either align with the bank and say, hey, we're coming at you really hard. There's going to be 500,000 confirmed signups on day one because everyone wants that experience to be good. But then you're going to actually test all your operational chops. For half a million uh, end users signing up on the same day, you should expect 20% of them to fail KYC. And that's a lot of people that you're going to make unhappy. And most of it's not actually really a failure. It's just something in your onboarding flow didn't work quite right. And so learning the KYC funnel organically, slow to fast, is in fact one of the best things you can do, but it's also the most frustrating thing to do because you're like, I have these million people sitting in a backlog, why can't I onboard them all at the same time? This goes back to the waitlist 
people get, you know, who's getting on top, right? You could stagger them too. Yeah. Because um, even, you know, we're, we're actually planning to launch with a waitlist around 20,000. So, but we're not going to launch to all 20,000. We're just going to stagger it, you know, 100, 1,000, 2,000. It's exactly what, how Peter described it. It's, we want to make sure, yeah, we don't expect day one we're going to work, right? We actually expect, if it actually if it works, I'll be worried. It means something, something's not, you know, we haven't done, you know, done everything. So, yeah, we actually expect to be, you know, for us to fail somewhere along the line. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. So each partner is different in their underwriting, their customer segment, their customer base, their community. And I would consider all of them alternative by definition because otherwise they just go through the traditional banking networks. So we take this mindset of flexibility to the partner first off. So here, here's the basic equation. The less we understand and the more creative the underwriting is, the more credit enhancements we want from the partner until the data proves out. Describe credit enhancements, you mean reserves? Uh, reserves or indemnifications or mm -hmm. guarantees by the company, et cetera. Um, and so yeah, we, we, so if you say, listen, people with green shirts pay their loans back better. Okay, I say great, I, I can't find that in my banking repertoire, but I'll trust you. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to put money aside and we're gonna watch these green shirts versus red shirts and if, in fact, green shirts provide better, then you don't have to keep as much money in the bank. And that's and, the same for pretty much all of the early stage of the, the fintech relationship. So at the beginning, there's going to be an expectation of a higher reserve for fraud because they're basically going to just assume it's going to go bad and the bank's going to say, we're not eating the fraud. You guys as the fintechs have to eat it. And there'll be a gate to growth. So if the fraud rates or the loan loss rates are out of control, the bank will just say, sorry, you can't add new users right now. And because they're really the bank's users, it'll feel really frustrating, but in fact, it will be the thing that governs what you do. And I have to echo what Peter said, e every one of you will be attacked. It just will happen. And it's, a, it's not a bad thing, but you wanna limit it, catch it. So we're panicked as bankers, making sure you have enough reserves. So thank you for bringing up the, the fraud loss rates too. That that's concerns us much more than the credit loss rates because there are organized rings of bad actors um, that are very smart, very tactically inept, or adept. And then there are whole Facebook groups that, right, they're not even synthetic fraud to where they bought Eric Sprink's name, social security number, address. There are hundreds of thousands of people on Facebook that will open accounts. They're real people, but it's for the money to be laundered through. You know, you heard, hey, I won this contest. If you open an account in your name here, we'll give you 50 bucks. Well, they actually get 50 bucks, but they managed to move $5,000 through it before the bank could catch it. So there's all types of fraud out there. I, this is the boring operational stuff. Sorry, the bank ruined me. That's all good. Does that make sense? Okay, one more. Oh, sorry. So that's where it comes to, like, how have you chosen to do it? If you are directly connecting uh, to the bank somehow because the bank has published their own APIs, then you're basically starting over with the second bank. If you choose a platform like ours, we, we abstract that away from you. You code to us and you want to split it across two, three, five, ten banks, we'll make that happen for you. And it just depends. So there's no easy answer. Um, well, there is an easy answer. Don't connect directly to the banks. But... <laughs> Um, but in the absence of that, uh, you can do a bit of an abstraction model like um, Robert's done in his case as well. Yeah, so, so that, yeah, exactly that. We, uh, we, we try to build in an agnostic way in, in, terms of, um, um, in terms of our tech layer. So, so well, when we look at this, right, we have an app. Our app talks to our own internal REST API. And then separately, we plug and play into Centeria's API. Now, the great thing about uh, Centeria is, so KYC is a good example, right? They provide KYC service, but if we don't like it, 
we could easily swap out to another service provider. Um, and that's just because um, their, they care what, you know, their API is pretty an agnostic also. Um, it just happened behind the scene. They, they, they just switch a provider. So, so that's one example of that. Uh, my advice for anyone who's building, it's not just necessarily working with Centera, but it's just good practice, right, to, to build um, your tech stack to scale that way, keep it agnostic, and just have you know, no tight integration into anything. Yeah. One thing you should be aware of, though, as, as you bring on the second bank, you have to tell the first bank. And because it will change the definition of the account type from brokered or non-brokered to brokered for the bank. And so the other bank may say, I don't like that very much. Um, and, and or may specify that you're just, it, because of our contract with you, you, you need to just go leave our bank and go to another bank if necessary. So that's one thing. The other thing is to think about is at the API level, what, what are you gonna do when um, you have a challenging different types of APIs? And so if you're flipping between two providers of tech, say unit and treasury prime, that's actually gonna be quite complex. So you, if you're gonna do it with a partner, you wanna find the partner that can connect you to the banks so you don't have to do that work. But at the end of the business day, you'll still have to do reconciliation across both banks. So some operational burden will increase. What we try to do is make sure all of the banks have the same or ma ma uh, materially the same compliance policies so that as you in think about other banks, you don't have to have, on this way, this flow, you can do a transaction up to $1,000, but if you got allocated to this bank, you can only do a transaction up to $500, because that will suck from a user experience point of view. Yeah, just to add to that, there's also a cost part to it too. Um, you know, we're gonna scale with Coastal, and you know, the scale, you know, the, the economics of scale, right? The, the faster we scale up, the cheaper, thing, you know, in ma many other things. But the minute if we were trying to, for whatever reason, we decided to bring another bank, then you know, in some cases, that's going to add an additional cost to that. So it, it you know, from, from an economic standpoint, it may not make sense. So you know, we don't see right now that why we should switch different banks or have multiple banks. Um, but we don't know, right? In the future, we may have certain features that COSO may not support. Then, then it's a diff different use case. Um, but something to consider the cost. So time for like one last question, I think. Depends if you're fundraising or not. <laughs> Depends if you're fundraising or not. <laughs> we purge a wait list. So we purge it on a monthly basis, right? Because we, if we didn't purge, we will probably have about 40,000 users now on the wait list. Um, you know, we have the concept of vanity, right? It looks great, but um, we, we're just more realistic. Um, but regarding the point of that is, um, you know, we haven't hit there yet, but our strategy is actually the dormant users that mm -hmm. will, f and this is the concept of, you incentivize them, find ways to, to, to pull them back. Yeah. Um, you know, it's still early stage. We may even say, you know, six months or 12 months, we might just close their account if it's dormant. Um, Numerically, you should think about 75 cents to a dollar per user per month in ledger fees or account fees. So if it's worth it to you to tell your future investor, we have a total of 100,000 out of which 50,000 are super engaged, 30,000 are not very engaged, and 20,000, we haven't heard from them in a month, but we're starting a win-back campaign. That's one way to play it. But at some point, you probably don't want to spend the dollar per user per month. Um, and either you flip the customer and tell them, hey, you've been inactive. And again, see, Eric, he has to approve the language of debanking them, right? Because you can't just close their account. You actually have to give them money back if they've got deposits on file and so forth. Uh, avoid. I would strongly encourage not charging maintenance fees on dormant accounts. You will incur the wrath of the consumer, and that will be unpleasant. All right, well, listen, thanks, everybody, for your time today. Hopefully, this was a little bit helpful. And, and thank you, Eric, and thanks, Robert. Ha, ha, ha.